Yeah, hey, live stream is up, so you can begin whenever you'd like. I want to thank everyone for joining us on their beautiful Sunday afternoon to learn more about gardening for life. Our host, Jose German, is with us from New Jersey, and he is a tremendous asset to the state of New Jersey and hopefully to the attendees today. You're going to learn more about organic gardening. Uh, for those who want to submit a question, there is a Q&A. Uh, box on the bottom of your Zoom screen. So have a look for that and feel free to submit questions at any time. At the end of the session, I'll be going through the questions and asking Jose for you. And then for attendees, we're going to have a little raffle uh, as a thank you and an incentive for joining us today. So without further ado, I turn it over to Jose. Thank you, Pan. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to your first celebration of Earth Day. Uh, I am honored to be part of this uh, great initiative. Um, I would like to introduce quickly our organization, the Northeast Earth Coalition. We are a volunteer driven organization based in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, we work at community level uh, to protect the environment and promote local sustainability and food security. So welcome to our Gardening for Life uh, uh, workshop. Um, basically, uh, this is an introductory uh, webinar for people who has interest in uh, learning about uh, how to grow food in an organic way. Uh, we also will be offering a holistic approach um, about how integrated is uh, vegetable gardening with uh, habitats uh, and pollinators gardens. This webinar, we introduce you to the value intensive uh, farming technique. Uh, I have developed this technique over the years based on my own uh, personal experience. Uh, I hope uh, th this um, webinar inspired you to become an urban grower. Um, bio, because we don't use chemical to grow food, uh, we do it organically, intensive because we never stop planting and growing until the end of the season and sometimes beyond. Uh, we plan intensively and sometimes against traditional practices. When people say plant, 12 inches of separation and planting eight inch, inches of, separa of separation and getting the same result. We grow horizontally and in a vertical way to expand our capacity of producing more food. We take care of the soil, amending the soil when it's needed. We do crop rotation, and this is really important if you are planting anything in the family of cabbage, next time uh, you plant something different like a bean, so tomatoes or something else. Um, adding compost and compost tea and amending the soil is very relevant. Uh, Biointensive urban, urban farming promotes a maximum yields from a minimal area of land. And that is what you will see throughout the presentation. Also increase biodiversity and soil fertility and sustainability. The long-term goal is sustainability. It is particularly effective for backyard gardeners and small scale commercial farms. How you can achieve uh, this uh, technique in your yard? Uh, sometimes it's very convenient to use the methodology of food planting, a square food planting, also adding companion plants uh, and growing, like I said before, vertically and we're using container gardening tool and planting the next crop of generation through the season. And this is the key to be successful. Uh, you need to plan ahead your garden and even produce vegetables during the cold weather. And this is an inspiration picture. Uh, let's see all the details that this picture is telling us. If we go uh, and pay attention to what is growing at the ground level, 
where we see there are some letters, arugula, and then uh, growing up, we have uh, beans, um, and then in the right side, in a pot, in a terracotta pot, we have marigolds. The marigolds is a repelling plant to protect this section of the garden. We are also using a hanging basket. And then in the back, we have another hanging basket, green uh, in two tons. And we are growing there tomato and herbs all around. And this is the driveway. So we are taking advantage of everything. <clears throat> Over the season, we switch from sugar snap peas to beans and then cucumbers using the same trellis and in the same space. And behind, we have other uh, uh, vegetable growing uh, behind the trellis, uh, also a strawberry. Uh, and you see also garlic uh, at the near, near to the gutter uh, drainage. Uh, so that is everything is going on in such a small space. And this uh, picture was taken this morning, uh, St. Trellis, uh, it's the beginning of the season. Uh, we've covered it with some metal screen to protect them from starlings. It's the nesting, ta nesting time for them and they are damaging the, the garden if we don't protect them. Um, and then we have a rhubarb at the beginning of the picture at the bottom in the picture in the left, uh, rhubarb. And then uh, we are growing apple, espalier apple, no visible here, but they are right there in a very tiny space. Um, next to the foundation of the house, we decided this year to add uh, growing potato banks. In previous season, we have been able to harvest about <clears throat> 50 pounds of potatoes in, in, in the ground. This year I decided, well, let's increase potato using, using this as an experiment in bags and then keeping the, 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 the ground bed for other vegetable. 10 bags, we are estimating five pounds of potato each eventually, so 50 pounds of potatoes. And this picture also is telling us a lot of things here. We are growing lettuce uh, and the lettuce are planted in sequence. Every two weeks, we are planting six for lettuce. So we, we have lettuce all season long uh, because we are replenishing uh, them and harvesting at the same time. And the red trellis will be used for uh, sugar snappies. In this small space, we have two crops going up at the same time. And in the right side, the black containers are featuring many things here. And this is what is important to have the right tools when you are doing gardening. Those containers are self-watering containers. And that means that they have a, res a water reservoir at the very bottom of, of the container. And that water is keeping the moisture uh, for the vegetable they are growing there. So you don't need to feed with water uh, the, the seedling frequently because uh, they, the soil is already moist. Um, and the little hole that you see in the first uh, container <clears throat> is the place where you put the water. What I do with these uh, containers, well, in the left side, you see the vegetable that we are growing now. And then in the right side, we'll be developing the seedling that we'll be transplanting to the ground later on. So we don't wait to spend what we planted, we continue planting new things immediately. So let's move now to the how-to. Learning about climate and planting song is very relevant because it's telling us why we need to plant and when we need to plant. And we will see later on also companion plants and diversity and the new garden checklist. This is a pollinator garden that we created um, in a uh, pocket park in downtown Montclair. And here is um, the hardiness, the plant hardiness zone map. Since we have people from Montclair, Connecticut, and New York, uh, I decided to put the three uh, different uh, hardiness zones. Um, um, in the in the diagram. 
So Montclair, New Jersey is 6B. Trumbull, Connecticut is 6B, 7A. And New York City is 7A, 7B. And that is telling us all the different temperature and, you know, and weather condition during the season. So that we were able to plan according to what is allowed by the hardiness zone. So now let's move to the secret of having a green thumb. If you are one of those people who said, every plant I touch dies, stop blaming yourself. Having a green thumb is often us having a mystical powers uh, when it comes to plant care. People blessed with green thumbs seems to have some magical one that makes plant thrive. The opposite of a green tongue is traditionally defined as a black tongue, but I prefer the, the term numb tongue. Those with numb tongues are unable to get plants to grow, even if they really like plants. However, a numb tongue is not necessarily a permanent condition. So what can you do to turn your numb tongue to a green tongue? Let's talk about soil. And that is the process to transform from a non tongue to a green tongue. You need to know what you are doing. So the soil definition is a living uh, organism. And this organism is compiled by um, providing nutritional support for people it has nutritional needs on its own and is also integrated by minerals and creatures along uh, you know other uh, components basically iron oxide unicellular bacteria and filaments protozoa and amoebas nematodes and that is the topic for another uh, webinar uh, fine rules and mites and um, Compost is the most efficient and sustainable way to improve or amend your soil. And we will see this quickly. I know that you already provide to your community a compost uh, a webinar, but let's go to the basic. Uh, composting is using your kitchen leftover, green, vegetable, organic, uh, and you mix them with the browns, leave from the fall, uh, grass clipping, and then you create something special. And why composting is important? Because the less uh, waste in your home you send to the landfill, you are reducing your carbon for the spring. Reducing waste uh, uh, can go to the landfill or incinerator is not only uh, good for the environment, but for the health of other people, especially community that are using incinerators. And how this works? What we see here in this graphic is a combination of many layers, wood chip at the bottom, green leaf, brown leaf, kitchen waste, brown leaf again. And the uh, grass clipping and the uh, brown are very special in the mix. The grass clipping are highly concentrated in nitrogen. So that is really good for your compost and your soil eventually. And the brown leaf are uh, using, can be used as a filter to reduce the amount of odors getting out of the compost pile. So what not to do with your compost? Never ever add animal products dated on oil or grease to your compost because that would be attracting rodents and other animals. Never add diseased plants because it can spread disease in your garden. Uh, and never add wheat because eventually if they have seed, they will be multiplying um, more in your garden. Now let's take actions. Uh, get a compost bin. Um, stop throwing away your kitchen organic materials and transform your waste into a natural fertilizer. And remember one thing, keep producing compost and feeding your soil. And here we have some examples. Um, the first one, the white one, is for your countertop in the kitchen. Um, you can put all your kitchen left over there, accumulate it, and then go outdoor and use a tumbler like this, which is very efficient in a space and easy to manage if you are a new gardener.
And here we have a multi-layer vermicomposter tower for outdoor and indoor. Uh, I have one and during the cold weather I have in my basement. Um, it's very efficient. Uh, you will be amazed to see the transformation of your leftover in the kitchen into uh, uh, one casting uh, in few weeks. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, but one of the things that you need to be aware of during the winter time, so you have a vermi compost in your basement, you need to constantly be feeding them because when they are hungry, if they don't find food, they will be getting out of the compost bin and you will be messy. So try to keep them, you know, very satisfied with food. And remember, this one uh, don't survive the winter outside. So it's just for inside and, and weather, you know, over uh, 50 degrees. In summary, uh, healthy soil produce healthy veggies. Now let's grow food because that is the purpose of this uh, webinar. And here we have seasonal planting. Seasonal planting is telling us what we can grow in different steps of the year during the growing season. Early March to April is time to plant any frost tolerant crops. Uh, and I have a partial list of the things that you can do right now, but basically arugula, lettuce, uh, chard, uh, and that is what I'm growing uh, in my yard. Sugar snap peas, I planted cilantro, I have lettuce, pot choy, cabbage, uh, Chinese cabbage, kale, uh, collard greens, onions, all of these are already going radishes. And if you want to have the food list, I recommend you to go to our website, uh, www.neearth.org blog. And there is a lot of information, very valuable, not only for vegetable gardening, but for wildlife habitat and pollinators and other environmental issues. Learning about, you see, um, Sometimes we buy seeds, but we don't pay attention to the information that is in the seed. Everything that you need to know about the seed that you are planting in your garden is right there in the package. If we look into the left picture, uh, basil, we see it at the bottom that it is a heirloom and non-GMO. And that is important because that is premium quality seed. And then the, in the top right side, USDA organic. In the left, which is important, is USA product products. Uh, we don't want to have ch uh, Chinese seed here. So I don't know if you remember the big issue last year about the Chinese mysterious Chinese uh, seed. In the back, um, we have the basil, the name, uh, grow guide. Uh, we see the map with the hardiness uh, song. And also the song exposure, we see oh, the distance spacing between one plant and another. And they even have a QR code to connect you with additional information. Another example of the, of the, of the package is this one, parsley, you stay organic. Um, and then 75 days to harvest. This is important because you will be planning ahead your meals. And then the same thing, the map with the hardiness song and all the information related to the seed. And in this uh, graphic, what we have is basically a very important message. If we see the, the, the graphic from the top to the bottom, April, May, March, April, May to the bottom, is beet, broccoli, cabbage, carrot, cauliflower, kale, lettuce, peas, and spinach. And in the middle, between June, July, and August, beans, Brussels sprout, corn, cucumber, peppers, onions, squash, and tomato. In the right side, it's not a coincidence. We have the same kind of things that we have uh, early in the, in the season. Beets, broccoli, cabbage, carrot, cauliflower, kale, peas, spinach. That is telling us that when we are purchasing seeds, we need to buy double for the spring and late summer. 
And here we have the new gardening checklist. If you are new in gardening and you don't have one, but you want to create one, the first thing that you need to, to determine is the sunlight exposure uh, and design your planting area. Know the quality and composition of your soil. If you are using the native soil, which is the soil that you uh, is in the ground, be sure that you are getting a soil test from uh, any uh, lab uh, available uh, in your community. Uh, sometimes the extension program of college and university, they have it. Uh, the master gardening program, they have you know um, the resources to do uh, uh, soil tests. Uh, it's not expensive. It costs you probably about $40 and you can send them the sampling of the soil by mail. But in this time of the season, it's really late to do that. If you are decided to do uh, a new garden, uh, I suggest you to get organic soil in your uh, preferred nursery. Um, there is advantage or disadvantage on deciding and tilling and, uh, uh, the ground and creating raised bed. Uh, I feel more comfortable using raised bed for many reasons. So get some basic tools like hand shovels, uh, also really important, uh, organize your seed uh, and, and put them for storage. Um, and outsmart wildlife uh, problem with fencing, uh, net or whatever way you need you know, to protect the garden, do it in advance because it's really frustrating when you are creating a garden and a groundhog comes and eat everything or a squirrel or whatever. Uh, so be prepared for that. And here is another inspirational uh, picture. Uh, this garden in particular produced more than 700 pounds of veggies per year. Uh, uh, in, the, in the front, we see broccoli mixed with uh, black eyed Susan and then some kale in the right side, gladiolos, and then behind potatoes, basil, uh, more uh, potatoes, more gladiolos, more kale, and in the trellis, beans are growing there. And in the containers, uh, we are growing there uh, strawberries. Uh, this uh, garden in particular was designed to be protected by deer and groundhog. That's why they decided before we do anything, let's do, do it right. Uh, and you can see how convenient, it's very practical, it's no big, but enough for them to grow something, you know, next to the kitchen, which is really important. And this is another example for people who have had little space and this is a home, uh, a townhouse in Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, and the homeowner decided to do something small but practical and you know, they want to grow some herbs and also some uh, lettuce. This is more for a front yard, uh, beautiful matching the architecture of the, of the house and don't be shy doing your vegetable in the front yard. You can do something really nice and eye catching and people will be happy to see, you know, a beautiful garden, vegetable garden or edible garden combination of flowers and vegetable in the front yard. And at the same time, you can create an oasis in your backyard, uh, take, take advantage of the space, even feed limited, mix vegetable with native plants, this is a pollinator garden in the left side uh, with some vegetable. And then in the right side, you can see more vegetable in the front and behind all the pollinators, which are, you know, a perfect combination for the environment. And here we can see another example of combining uh, vegetable with some flowers, beans growing up, uh, pollen grains, Etc. And this is one of my favorite pictures uh, because a lot of things are going off if we pay attention closely. We can see in the left side corner at the bottom arugula, then lettuce, then spinach, then chai, tomatoes, uh, peppers, onions, and garlic, and sunflowers. So everything in one place. And the combination uh, is beautiful, uh, attractive, 
and nobody can complain to you have something like that in your front yard. Invite beneficial wildlife, attract pollinators, also attract beautiful birds. And when you are attracting birds, they are also gardening uh, herd birds. They are eating the caterpillars, they are eating uh, your um, cabbage uh, and collard greens. Um, so it's very convenient to have them in your side. Transform your backyard into an open room for relaxing times and also regular meals. And this uh, yard in particular has in the left side, all the vegetable there and strawberry and many things happening. And then you, know, you take the food from there and go to the kitchen, prepare them and have the meal outside. Great, great you know, combination. Let's move now to companion plants. The tree system is a Native American ancient agricultural practice, beans, squash, and corn. And the combination is perfect. They are supporting each other in many ways. The squash is providing ground cover to keep the moisture around the corn and the beans. The beans is providing them to the corn and the squash nitrogen. And the corn is providing support to the beans to grow. Perfect example of collaboration. And here we see 10 companion plants to protect tomatoes only from insects. Basil, cabbage, chimes, collards, north station, parsley, mint, marigold, and geranium. And mint in particular, if you surround your, uh, your garden from mint, uh, and you had uh, the groundhog problem, they don't like mint. The, the smelling is disgusting for them. So do that. And here we have more uh, repelling plants that were not uh, all included in the other list, like a rosemary, chamomile, spearmint, uh, and chrysanthemums. And another example of diversity. Diversity is good. When you have a diverse garden, um, all the plants are uh, supporting each other. If you have a fungus problem, it's not affecting the whole garden. It's only affecting a small section and easy to manage. And make your garden productive. You can have healthy food, premium quality, instead of your kitchen. Um, you can also maximize your crop and usually take pictures every week during the growing season. So this is one week and the following week you see the abundance of producing more. In the picture we are showing lettuce to different kind, a strawberry, potatoes, more a strawberry behind and more potatoes and flowers from the garden. And here is another motivational harvest picture showing uh, different kind of potatoes. Uh, it's late in the summer, so we have uh, uh, tomatoes, two different kinds of beans, and a lot of broccoli. And when you are growing your food, you take pride in the quality of the products that you are producing. And this is the kind of products uh, that we produce at home. First quality, I can say, you know, without any doubt that this is premium quality, even better than supermarket quality, organically grown. Another example, abundance uh, and healthy, you know, carrots. Uh, with carrots, I tried to produce two crops uh, per year. One of them uh, late in the, I start planting them late in the, in the fall and harvesting them in March. How I do that? Well, it could be a little bit tricky, but it's simple. Uh, I try to protect, uh, to plant them ahead of time and put a layer of uh, leaf to uh, protect them from freezing and covering with a fabric. And in March, last week of March, every year, I harvesting these kind of carrots. And here is last summer. So abundance, diversity, uh, when I plant, I plant a lot because I want to produce a lot. So be hungry when you are planting um, 
your vegetable. Uh, and planting your vegetable, you are deciding ahead of time what you'll be cooking eventually every week or every day. And the transformation, healthy meals, healthy life. And what happens when you have an abundance like this in your yard? Well, you can do many things. We eat a lot, number one. Uh, we share also with neighbors and friends, uh, but we preserve uh, some of them and we donate also to food pantry. And preserving some of the vegetables is really easy to do it. We don't need to spend anything in doing that. <clears throat> and here is some example of how I preserve vegetable. Uh, canning is one of the techniques. Uh, I do a lot of canning uh, with them. Uh, uh, and my intention is to have every week two or three meals with things that are coming directly from the vegetable garden. And in the right side, tomatoes, it, you saw the pictures, we have a very abundant productivity of uh, tomatoes. Uh, um, so we dry them uh, in a machine, a dryer, it's, you know, it's inexpensive uh, to do that. Uh, the machine costs probably $35. <clears throat> but it's very helpful. And you can use the, the dried tomato uh, in salads, uh, even for a snack, um, or you can put them in soup. But the most important thing uh, is seed preservation. And I call this liberation. Liberation from companies who are manipulating the seed, who, who has you know, control of the seed of the food that we grow. Um, and it's not difficult to do it. Every year, I try to preserve as much as I can and have my own seed, so I don't need to buy them. Uh, in the picture, we see arugula is the first one, and then uh, cilantro, sugar snap peas, and bush beans. And even a small garden can be productive. Uh, you know, I recommend you to start small uh, and then as you uh, progress learning more and developing gardening skill, uh, you can expand your garden. This uh, garden in particular is a community garden uh, that we install in uh, downtown Montclair. It's a demonstration garden to show uh, the community that they can grow vegetables uh, in a very efficient way. And you can see the abundance of everything is doing so great. Um, it's really small. Uh, and people stop by since it's downtown and they can see you know, everything. And we have a sign with a QR code and it's directing them to the, to the information of the garden. So thank you for your attention and for uh, giving me the opportunity to share my gardening experience and remember, Keep your garden free uh, of pesticide. Um, incorporate um, pollinators. Uh, keep growing and growing, um, and then uh, uh, preserving the environment. Thank you, Jose, uh, for a great presentation. We have a couple of questions. One is, when is the best time to plant potatoes in a raised bed? The best time to plant tomatoes in a raised bed is after you know the, the, the date of the last frost in your community. Uh, doesn't apply to everyone. For example, in Northern New Jersey it would be May 5th. So Connecticut should be a little bit later I would say mid May. And is the same for potatoes then as tomatoes? Or no. Potato? Okay. Potatoes for tomatoes, you can start very early because tomatoes are cold tolerant. Uh, I started planting uh, potatoes uh, two weeks ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. I um, noticed those potato bags that you had. Um, and I know that you said you're experimenting with those this year. I've never seen those before. Are those available online and 
would you recommend if you have a yeah. shady area? Yeah, no, you can, they are available online. Yeah, just Google and Amazon. I got from Amazon, they have it. Uh, okay. Yeah, they are not expensive and they last several, you know, uh, growing season. Okay. Um, very convenient, very practical. You know. I noticed that you had a lot of companion plants in the photographs of the different gardens. And I liked the slides where you showed different companion plants, but I mean, I think that people forget how important they really are. Is that right? You should really- Yes, they are really, they are really important for many reasons. They are protecting uh, your crop. They are also uh, giving you, you know, the plants. So you, you, you are planting them and you are eating them at the same time. Right. It's just, you know, creating some diversity and protection and using them as a repellent for insects and predators. Uh, another question is about composting. Um, I have a double-sided composter and it gets full fast. We eat a lot of vegetables and save every scrap. I keep just filling my composter, but not sure how to store the compost or how to know when not to keep adding to the compost so the compost cooks appropriately. So can you just expand a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, that is one of the, of the, of the challenges the people who has only one compost being uh, are facing. When you are having only one compost being in your jar, you need to look for the compost bin that you can have the drawer at the bottom and you get the, the compost from the bottom because you are still putting adding more layers on top of that. But my suggestion is get two instead of one. One is growing up and then another which is processing already. So by the time that you finish you, you uh, process a uh, compost of being, you are already having another one and you will start from scratch in the other one. How long does it take for scraps to turn into compost in general? Depends. Uh, for some people, uh, it could be three or four months. Uh, for others, it could be more. In that case, one of the, of the best way to accelerate um, the compost transformation is using an accelerator material, which is organic and you can get it online also. So get okay. a compost accelerator and that will be speeding the process. Okay, good to know. Um, I'm not sure that I know what fungi flies is, but someone's asking about what in your opinion is the best way to get rid of fungus flies in an indoor or outdoor plant? I've tried cinnamon and it worked for some of them. However, some of my plants didn't recover. Uh, if they're in an edible plant, is it unsafe to eat? Well, when you got that, when you notice the, 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 the fly, it's because you have already a bit infest, infestation. So see that happen, use some uh, sanitizer, so uh, organic soap, and you can uh, first watch with a, with a hose, with the most powerful, you know, chip of uh, this other hose, uh, and spray them uh, strongly at least every day for three days. If they don't go away, then use some uh, organic repellent for them. Okay. Um, one more question has just come in. I have several raised beds from last season. I used organic soil. Can I just mix it up with my compost to get started for this season? Missing the plants, the old plants? Uh, I'm not clear. Just Can I just mix up the raised beds with my compost? The dirt from the raised beds? Oh, yeah. But not necessarily. I don't see any reason. You can continue uh, improving the raised bed soil. Uh, with compost, but not putting the, 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 the raised bed soil back into the compost. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Can you speak a little bit more about crop rotation? Yes. Crop rotation is the technique which uh, allow you to grow in, a, in the same space, different kind of crops. Mm -hmm. Let's put an example. If you are planting potatoes, next, See, so next next step would be after they are done is planting beans because bean will be restoring the soil, uh, all the nutrients that were taken by the potatoes. If you are planting tomatoes and potatoes are in the same family. 
So that is another thing that you need to take into consideration. So you plant the potatoes and tomato plant beans next, next time. So you are planting anything in the cabbage family, same thing, plant beans or all the different crop, which is not related to the crop that was previously planted in that particular space. Is a rotation okay to do just every other year? Because I have a small garden with raised No, beds. you didn't, through the season, throughout the season. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone's got their hand raised. Bill, do you see? Oh, not anymore. Okay. Well, I just wanted to thank everyone. We're going to do our raffle now if there are no more questions. Uh, Josie has a question. Okay. Is she still here? I already asked it. Sorry, I actually I did it with the soil. I wanted to do the soil. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. So we have um, I, I just thanking Jose again for a great presentation and for people to join us. Um, I'm gonna share my screen if I can. Let's see. So we have this handy dandy thing here. I want to show you all what what uh, our Friends at Home Depot were kind enough to donate is this pot with some organic soil, garden gloves, seeds, and a little kid's kit with a flower pot to teach them about gardening. It's a nice packet that Jose, um, that uh, Home Depot and Trumbull was kind enough to donate. So I'm gonna spin the wheel here. And then the winner is for this incentive. Carol Markland. So thank you, Carol. I'll contact you directly about getting that off to you. <laughs> and everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. And Jose, again, thank you. I hope you all found this helpful and informative. And if you would check out um, the rest of our calendar this week for our other events, we've got something on composting on Wednesday and Thursday is pollinator pathway if you're into gardening, and then there are others throughout the week. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Happy gardening. Yes, bye-bye. Bye-bye.